So here's a list of the treatments that we now have available for cough treating our patients with osteoporosis. And I've highlighted the ones that I'm going to focus on. So simple calcium vitamin D supplements, that's particularly relevant to the audience because uh, we're going to use that uh, in a lot of our frail elderly patients as first choice. Then we've got the anti-resorptives, that bigger group uh, today. So those are osteoclast inhibitors. That includes all of the bisphosphonates and the new anti-resorptive, which we're using more and more, and I'll explain why uh, later on, that's denosumab, subcutaneous denosumab. Then we have one truly anabolic treatment, and that explains why daily subcutaneous teriparatide injections and then lastly, we have strontium ranolate, for which, of course, there are lots of new is being restrictions, and I'll explain those in more detail. So starting off with simple calcium vitamin D supplements. These prescribe the treatment of choice for our frail elderly patients. So those in institutional care, those in sheltered accommodation, the housebound elderly, these are still frail elderly. They're very likely to be vitamin D deficient. They're often going to have suboptimal calcium intakes. And we have good evidence from trials of 20 the ago that supplementation with combined calcium and vitamin D, it has to be calcium and vitamin D together, many years ago, will reduce the risk of hip fractures and non-vertebral fractures by about one-third. It's about one gram of elemental calcium, 800 units of vitamin D3 each day. There are lots of different formulations and preparations. You've got chewable tablets, swallowable tablets, caplets, soluble preparations. You can usually find something that will suit each uh, individual. One point I want to emphasize is that giving vitamin D on its own, there is no evidence that giving vitamin D alone reduces the risk of fractures. And that's a consistent finding from individual clinical trials and meta-analysis. You need to give a combination of calcium together with vitamin D if you expect a reduction in fracture risk uh, in your patients. Can we just ask, does it, even if it's a calcium-replete, I mean, calcium diet and not in a nursing home, is that across the board? It is. Okay. It is. I mean, obviously, there may be contraindications to calcium. And as I'll show in the next slide, when you're using concomitant treatments, the situation is different. But if you're using it as a standalone treatment in a frail elderly patient, the answer to your question is yes. So in terms of prescribing it with other treatments, for example, with bisphosphonates, with denosumab, um, it's a sensible thing to do. We did it in the randomized controlled trials, although we did tailor the calcium element of the supplementation to the patient's dietary calcium intake, which is the point you've just made. So, so if someone's drinking a pint of milk or more per day, and you're, gonna, you're treating them with alandronic acid, you don't need to give them a calcium supplement, but you might well still want to give them a, a vitamin D supplement. We know that vitamin D insufficiency deficiency will impair the response to treatments like uh, bisphosphonates, so you want to make sure that your patient is vitamin D replete. Uh, in terms of the mechanism why combined calcium and D does result in a reduced risk of fractures, it's probably both an effect on bone as well as, well as an effect on falls risk. So there's reasonable evidence from the RCTs that you might well reduce the risk of falls as well as uh, improving bone strength and bone quality. And we used to think, well, that's great. That's nice and easy. We can give calcium vitamin D supplements and it'll do some good and it won't do any harm by and large until we had this. These meta-analyses first published in the BMJ by Ian Reid and colleagues uh, from New Zealand. And this apparently showed an increased cardiovascular risk in patients who received uh, calcium supplements with or without vitamin D. There's been a lot of discussion, a lot of criticism of these analyses, particularly of the, the way they've defined the endpoints um, and they were retrospective safety data analyses. But to cut a long story short, the consensus view now is that there probably or very likely is not an increased cardiovascular risk with calcium supplements, um, unless you come from New Zealand and you're from Ian Reid's group, where they strongly still support that. But I think the bottom line as shown there, is that we have much more convincing evidence that calcium supplements overall are associated with reduced mortality, that's a very consistent finding, than any evidence that you increase 
the risk of cardiovascular disease. And it's not just me saying that. The MHRA have also issued a statement. I don't, I don't think a lot of people notice this. It is still there. It's on the website. I've checked. I've got a slide of it here. And they actually came out and said, um, the studies of cardiovascular risk do not support prescribing changes. So it's still important to choose first-line treatment, the frail elderly, combined calcium and vitamin D supplements in order to reduce their risk of hip and other non-vertebral fractures. So that's calcium and vitamin D supplements. Moving on to bisphosphonates. That, that's the treatment we use most of all for our patients with osteoporosis. They, of course, will reduce bone turnover. They're primarily targeting the osteoclast, but secondarily, that will also affect the osteoblasts. You reduce the so-called remodeling space. There are about half a million active remodeling units on the surface of your bone at any one time point, and you reduce the number of those spaces, so you reduce the remodeling space. You enhance or prolong the phase of passive secondary mineralization because you're slowing up bone remodeling, and those will contribute to some increase in bone density, more of that in a moment. And by preventing further bone loss, you preserve bone structure. And compared with placebo, it's pretty easy to believe that's a good thing. So overall, in terms of most episodes of trauma or everyday forces, the bone is stronger. But there is one important exception to that, relating to a long-term adverse effect of anti-resorptives. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but in general, the bone is stronger as a result of those three components. We have several different bisphosphonates from which we can choose one to treat our patients. It begs the question of, are they all the same? The answer is, no, they're not. For example, they may uh, vary in terms of how strongly they adhere to the surface of bone. They have strong bone affinity, but it varies logarithmically between the different molecules. They will inhibit osteoclasts to different extents in terms of potency. There are things like convenience, tolerability, adherence, etc., bioavailability, IV versus oral. And on the basis of all of that, you could rank your various different bisphosphonates. Actually, etidronate, unfortunately, sadly, is no longer available. We were using that in a few patients. So if we look at the others, I would put intravenous bisphosphonate at the top, a lot of that is because you guarantee delivery to the skeleton as long as your patient turns up for the infusion. I'd put Ivy's Ledronate at the top, for which we have the best RCT fracture data. Next, I'd put Ibandronic Acid, IV, and then I would rank the three oral bisosinates, the amino-containing bisosinates, uh, together. Why have I put Zeledronate top? So it's an infusion once per year. The licensed dose is five milligrams once per year. The RCT, I'm showing you the results here, big study, well-powered, very impressive reductions in fractures, fractures across the board, vertebral, non-vertebral, hip. It doesn't get a lot better than that. When we first saw these results, we thought, well, game over. We're out of a job. All you've got to do is get your patient along, slam in the Zeledronate, and, and you've done the job. Of course, life is never that simple. Um, what we noticed was that there was a nephrotoxicity signal with Zeledronate, and there were several cases of quite severe nephrotoxicity. And on the back of that, there are now restrictions, and you are not supposed to use Zeledronate below a certain threshold EGFR of 35 because of the risk of nephrotoxicity. So that immediately limits its use, for example, in a post-hip fracture population or a very elderly population. You've got to make sure your patients are vitamin D replete. This will powerfully switch off Osteoclasts, it'll stop calcium effluxing from bone, so you run the risk of hypocalcemia. So you've got to make sure your patient's vitamin D replete, plus the zeledronate will not work unless your vitamin D is above uh, a certain threshold level. I've put here in the green that we now have a generic dose which is most readily available at, a, at the four milligram dose. The five milligrams is the license dose for osteoporosis, but four milligrams is just as good when you look at head-to-head -head studies and you compare it with higher, low, lower doses with higher doses. And on the back of those studies, I haven't got time to show you all the results, we have adopted that dose now until we get a, a generic five milligram dose readily available. We're using four milligrams um, and we saved ourselves a huge amount of money because it's gone from 300 milligrams per dose, per single dose, to about eight pounds per dose. So we've saved a lot of money uh, by switching uh, to that dose. 
We also have another study, which is a post-hip fracture study in men and women, where they were randomized placebo or once per year zoledronic acid. And you can see on the left-hand side a significant reduction in clinical fractures. On the right-hand side, you also see some very interesting data, a reduction in overall mortality. This is the first time that we'd ever seen this in an osteoporosis trial. Quite a significant, um, probably clinically relevant parting of the curves. These are safety data. It wasn't the primary outcome measure. And we know that zoledronate stimulates the immune system. It stimulates gamma-delta T cells. And we think it may be enhancing immune responsiveness and resistance to infection, for example. So, so that's interesting. So that's on the good side. On the bad side is this. And here we're looking at the hip fracture rates from the randomized trials and those over the age of 75. And what we see now is a loss of effect in terms of significance for hip fracture reduction in those over the age of 75 compared with younger patients. And there is a significant interaction with age when you do the statistics. And that's a concern. And you could say, well, is it numbers? Is it just the population they studied? But it's actually been a bit of a consistent finding with bisphosphonates in general. So that's a concern, because obviously the average age of hip fracture is in excess of 80, and you want to be confident your treatment works in that age group. And I'll contrast these data with those for denosumab and give you a rationale for using denosumab in your older patients or on the back of this um, hip fracture comparison at different ages. Back to the good side of zoledronate. Um, it's a very long-acting treatment. It has very high bone affinity. It has the highest bone affinity of all, any of the bisphosphonates. In fact, one IV infusion, this is over three years. We've got other studies at four years and five years. You'll get maintenance of effect. So your bone density goes up on the left or your bone turnover goes down on the right. And the bone density goes up, it stays up. The bone markers go down, they pretty much stay down. It's having its desired effect for several years after a single infusion. So increasingly... I am just using a single infusion of zoledronic acid. We've also got post hoc analysis of the randomized trials, looking at the fracture rates from the intervention trials, showing that one dose was as good as three doses or four doses or six doses. So in a lot of patients, I'm saying just have one infusion. We might rescan you in three or four years, and, and that'll do. So that's something a lot of us are doing more commonly now. But what we use most commonly and probably is the first line choice still, oral bisphosphonates, in particular alandronic acid. It's been around a long time. It's dirt cheap. They're virtually giving it away. And if you look at the, the randomized trials, it will reduce the risk of all the major osteoporosis-related fractures. With that caveat again, though, for bisphosphonates, you have very, very limited data in those over the age of 80. And bones in the very old are different than bones in younger patients. Um, and there are glycations, non-enzymatic glycations, which affect bone quality. There are differences in the crystal structure, and there are accumulation of microcracks, and so on and so forth. And there is a bit of a rationale to think that bisphosphonates might not necessarily be the best treatment for everybody, particularly as they get uh, much older. The other problem with alandronic acid is it'd be great if everybody could just take it and no problem, they'll all stay on it, have no, no trouble. Big but, the majority of patients at six months, these are so-called real-world data. Um, it's it's, it's uh, a trial in primary care showing that the majority of patients, for many different reasons, have stopped their treatment with alendronate by six months. And that's been a pretty consistent finding when you look at uh, any of these studies. So whatever way you look at it, you're going to have to think of other treatments for quite a lot of patients. You might say, well, I'll, I'll consider another oral bisphosphonate because they might be different, it's a bit like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or statins. I'll just try one that's a bit different. And you can do that. Uh, in my experience, um, if you're getting a, a GI side effect, I don't think it makes a lot of difference, but you might say, I'll go for resedronate. There are some pros and cons with resedronate when you compare it with alendronate. It actually has much lower bone affinity, and that's good or bad, depending on how you look at it. In some ways, it's good, because if it has lower bone affinity, it might penetrate cortical bone more, and therefore it might have a better effect at the hip region. And also, if you're in a situation where you're concerned about over-suppressing bone turnover, you might be worried about osteoporosis of the jaw, 
or you might be worried about atypical fractures of the femur. And for example, that might be a particular worry for people on glucocorticoids, prednisolone. You might prefer to go for a shorter acting, lower bone affinity, less potent bisphosphonate like resedronate. So I, I tend to use resedronate as my oral bisphosphonate for patients on glucocorticoids. There's also a bandronate, which you can give once per month, and that's the main difference. So, yeah, you're a little bit less likely to get GI side effects with the bandronate. And although it's not in the BNF, it's not in the SPC, I can tell you it pretty much never causes nephrotoxicity. But, you know, you've got to have the confidence to use it under those circumstances. So we occasionally use it uh, where someone has renal impairment and we want specifically to use an IV bisosinate. That's pretty rare. This is the main thing, side effect, long-term adverse effect of bisphosphonates and probably denosumab as well, that we're really concerned about and has definitely changed clinical practice. And the first time, for the first time in my medical career, I am being sued by two patients <coughs> over this. I don't think they got a case, <laughs> um, but it's happening. So these are atypical femur fractures. Who has seen an atypical femur fracture in a patient on bisphosphonates? Hands up. Only a few. Okay, usually we get, we get a higher response rate to that. So actually, perhaps the minority of the audience, and that's, that's interesting. Well, we've seen 50 in our clinical practice in Cardiff in the last two to three years. And we're now seeing a steady trickle rather than the odd one or two. They're always lateral cortex of the femur. They're always perpendicular to the surface. It's very unusual to have a lateral stress fracture in the femur. They're nearly always medial. So um, exercise-related um, stress fractures, osteomalacia fractures are medial. These are lateral. You only, ever, you only really see that in one, other, one or two other situations, including hypophosphatasia, which is a very rare inherited disease, where you have underactive osteoblasts, low bone turnover, giving you a clue to the possible cause here, because bisphosphonates suppress bone turnover. They're quite often bilateral. In about one third of cases, they're preceded by pain. Any patient who has groin pain or thigh pain or hip pain, they're on bisphosphonate, particularly if they've been on a long time, x-ray the femur. If you're still in doubt and the pain persists, get an MRI or an isotope bone scan, or you're definitely going to get sued. I'm getting sued. Well, I mean, I did some of those things anyway, and I'm still getting sued. The other problem is you bang a nail down to um, stop it going to completion. The, most of them will go to completion if you don't put a, an intramedullary nail down. They still don't heal. They remain painful. You often need to reoperate upon. It's an off-license indication, but we often treat these patients with a short course of teriparatide, this anabolic treatment to try and increase bone tone and heal the fracture. Here's another one, a lady after seven years of alendronate, rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see that um, typical perpendicular stress fracture and that medial spike of bone. It's not oblique or spiral, and there are, var there are various criteria you're supposed to fulfill to define it as one of these um, bisphosphonate-related fractures, but we're seeing, seeing a steady flow of these. And off the back of that, um, we've had some changes with respect to duration of treatment. So we're still pretty happy to go out to five years of treatment, and we think the benefits nearly always outweigh the risks out to five years, and that's what we found in the clinical trials. Beyond that, you've got to be more careful. And what the MHRA say is at five years, you reconsider whether your patient should continue treatment. If they've had vertebral fractures, particularly if they've got multiple vertebral fractures, then you're probably justified in continuing with treatment, perhaps out to 10 years. You may want to stop at seven or eight years, but you're justified in going out to 10 years if they've got vertebral fractures. If they've got very low bone densities, again, you may feel that it's reasonable to continue treatment. But increasingly, we're saying if they don't have severe osteoporosis, don't have a very high risk, continuing risk of fracture, then stop at five years, stop it for two or three years. If you've got access to DEXA scanning, you might want to repeat the scan. If you've got access to bone markers, you can repeat bone markers. And if you see a deterioration in those, you might then say, I'm justified in restarting uh, the bisphosphonates. I've got two question marks after GEOP, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, because I'm particularly worried about the patients on prednisolone, where the guidelines say you just continue the bisphosphonate. You don't need to do bone density scans above the age of 65. But what steroids do is suppress osteoblasts after about six or months or so you're just suppressing osteoblasts. 
And then to throw in a bisphosphonate on top of that to further reduce bone turnover may well not be a good idea. The fracture data for bisphosphonates of patients on steroids is very poor. It's only vertebral fractures, nothing for non-vertebral fractures. So I got a much lower threshold for stopping bisphosphonates in people on prednisolone, and I'm, I'm uncomfortable continuing it beyond two or three years unless I've got bone density scanning evidence that they've got low bone density. So I, I think we might, we might be seeing a change um, in clinical practice for patients on steroids, but there's been no official change up until now. So moving on to denosumab, which is a newer anti-resortive. That is a monoclonal antibody, of course. It's an antibody to rank ligand, which stimulates osteoclasts. So it very quickly and powerfully switches off osteoclastic resorption bone. It switches off bone loss within a few hours. It comes for osteoporosis in one dose, pre-filled syringe, 60 milligrams, subcutaneous once every six months. It's licensed for women, postmenopausal osteoporosis, men on androgen, androgen deprivation treatment for CA prostate, and it's just about, to, if it hasn't got it already, within the next couple of weeks, it's going to get a, a, um, a general license indication for treating uh, male uh, osteoporosis. And we're using more of this now. We're getting increasingly confident uh, using it. The fracture data from the randomized trial are very good, almost identical to those figures I've just shown you for IV's legionate, so that's reassuring. What is different and better in some ways, not a head-to-head -head trial, but if you look at the denosumab data and compare the data for the overall population on the left and those over the age of 75 on the right, you certainly don't see loss of effect. I mean, it's still a very convincing reduction in hip fractures for those who are older over the age of 75. So you've got preservation of effect in older patients. And there are some differences in pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, of course, with denosumab compared with the bisphosphonate. Here's one example of that. And these are, are six years data from a phase two trial. The top curve is those who stayed on denosumab throughout the trial. And you can see at the femoral neck, the bone density is going up and up and up. We didn't see that with bisphosphonates. If you compare that with zelegionate, this is zelegionate once per year for six years, it plateaus. It goes up as you fill in the remodeling space, and it pretty much stays the same. With denosumab, you get a steady rise. And we've just seen an abstract form, eight years data for uh, denosumab from the major intervention trial, showing exactly the same. So that's an important difference. Um, as you turn up for each dose of denosumab, your antibody levels are pretty much zero. Your rank ligand antibody levels are pretty much zero. And you get some recovery of bone turnover as you come up for your each dose of denosumab. So you're getting a rapid suppression, then a 50% recovery in bone turnover at each um, dosing time point. When you administer the denosumab, you also get a surge in parathyroid hormone, which may also be behind this different effect on bone density, which just accumulates, increases year on year. And this is what we're seeing uh, in clinical practice. And you may say, well, you know, so what? Does that mean anything? And what these curves show you is that there is quite a good correlation between the increase in bone density and the reduction in fracture rates, both for vertebral fractures and non-vertebral fractures when you're looking at hip bone density changes. So it probably is clinically meaningful to see those bigger rises in bone density. So differences in pharmacokinetics, differences in ph pharmacodynamics, and it's not nephrotoxic. So that's important. So you can use it in patients with renal impairment, but be careful. Once they get an EGFR of less than 30, you've got to be careful. And I would suggest that should be administered in secondary care because they're at much higher risk of hypocalcemia. The EMA and the MHRA are just issuing safety updates. They've changed the SPC for denosumab, telling us to be more careful in patients with low GFRs and that we should be measuring their serum calcium both before and two weeks after the denosumab and encouraging patients to report symptoms of hypocalcemia. They've also ramped up the um, warnings on osteonecrosis of the jaw, and they're saying that if you're going to give someone denosumab, you should really sort out their teeth before you give them the denosumab because there's a heightened risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw, and more of that in a moment. And absolutely, definitely make sure they're vitamin D replete. I would suggest before every dose measure their vitamin D and make sure they're vitamin D replete or you're going to run into big trouble with bad hypocalcemia. It's a rapid onset of effect. It's also a rapid offset of effect. So if you, if you stop the denosumab, 
you'll get a rapid rebound increase in bone turnover and you'll lose the benefit quite quickly. So you've got to stay on it to maintain the benefit. It then begs the question for how long should you treat and do you just stay on it forever? Or what we've been doing in the clinic is giving them a shot of zoledronate at the end of a course of denosumab. We've achieved our target bone density and then we give them zoledronic acid and we're just getting our first patients coming back a year after that and hopefully I'll have some data to show you perhaps in 12 months time. This is just to remind you that the MHRA are on the case of denosumab for the osteonecrosis of the jaw and the hypocalcemia, and they've very recently reduced, uh, produced a safety update on that. They've also pointed out there have been a couple of cases of atypical femur fractures. You predict that they probably wouldn't be as common because you're getting some recovery of bone turnover, but we've seen two in the RCT program. It is nice approved, so you can use it, um, and we have used a lot of it in Cardiff, and we've treated well over a 1,000 patients now with denosumab. It is remarkably well tolerated uh, in general. As long as you're careful and you measure a vitamin D and a bone and renal profile before each dose, we, and you're appropriately cautious in renal impairment, um, it's a pretty safe treatment in general. Moving on to teriparatide, which as I've told you is the one true anabolic treatment for bone, which we'd love to use in the majority of our patients, but we can't because it's too expensive. It's 300 pounds per month. It is a one-off, two years course of treatment, but it is 300 pounds a month, so obviously it's going to be uh, used in a limited number of patients. It will stimulate bone turnover. It's kind of the opposite of bisphosphonates and denosumab. It's actually stimulating bone turnover. You're getting increased osteoclast and osteoblast function. You're getting some new bone formation. You're getting new trabecular growth, the trabeculae thicken, you get new supporting structures and the cortex thickens, and you improve the bone structure and the bone strength. And the fracture data are good. We've got good non-vertebral fracture data and vertebral fracture data, but no specific hip fracture data. They never did that trial. Here's a paired bone biopsy. This is an average response from the intervention trial, before and after treatment, where you can show an obvious anabolic effect. It's not stayed the same. You've got new bone formation and thickening of the trabeculae and the cortices. You can use it for postmenopausal osteoporosis and male osteoporosis. I think where it's also particularly an attractive treatment to use, and it makes physiological sense when you think of the pathophysiology of steroid-induced bone loss, is in that context for patients on um, steroids. And we have a head-to-head -head study, teriparatide versus alendronate. The bone density changes are much better with teriparatide. It, it, it was extended out to three years. At two years, there were 10 crush fractures in the alendronate group and only one in the teriparatide group, and that difference was maintained out to three years. So you've got pretty good evidence showing you that it's a very sensible treatment to use for patients on steroids. So um, you're not going to be able to use it for everybody. Of course you're not. You're going to use it with those with more severe osteoporosis at the highest risk of fracture, particularly where the evidence is most convincing in those who have multiple vertebral fractures and ongoing pain, they've already had bisphosphonates for years, then it's a very obvious thing to consider. And I think too often um, it's not even considered. You might also want to consider using it at the end of a five years course uh, of alendronate or treatment failures on anti-resorters because it's a different mo modality of treatment and the duration of treatment, as I've said, is out to 24 months. It's not a licensed indication but we have a lot of quite convincing kind of case, well, convincing, it's case series data. But in patients who've had this terrible problem with osteoporosis of the jaw, this is usually after invasive dentistry, you have a tooth extraction, and the gum mucosa does not heal, the bone becomes, the jaw bone becomes chronically exposed, it may become necrotic, it may become infected. Interventional surgery often makes it worse, it's unpleasant, it's painful. Um, and although it's probably quite rare, about, let's say, 1 in 10,000, 1 in 20,000 patients in osteoporosis, it's much more common in patients with malignancy where you use much higher doses of bisphosphonate, and there are lots of um, uh, risk factors for osteonecrosis anyway, things like chemotherapy and poor dental health. But in patients who do get osteoporosis of the jaw and they've been on bisphosphonates, there's reasonable evidence that you're going to help things by giving them a short course of teriparatide. You only need to give them treatment for two or three months. And we've got, we got reasonable published evidence that that will then result in healing rather than 
nine, 12 months of um, misery. And we, and we also use teriparatide for patients who have these atypical femoral fractures. Not a licensed indication, but we think it's reasonable. Last two slides, strontium ranolate. That used to be a really popular treatment, particularly in those over the age of 80, where we had good fracture data, some of the best fracture data in that age group. They had specific data um, in those over the age of 80. And we had data out to 10 years. It's not an anti-resortive. It was a nice thing to use as an alternative or after a few years of alendronate or after an atypical fracture. But the bad news, of course, is that it has restricted indications now. So we're only supposed to use it now for severe osteoporosis. Only those who, um, I can't remember what the terminology is, osteoporosis specialists are supposed to um, recommend it now. And it, in the context of the patient not being able to have any other osteoporosis treatments because of the risk of cardiovascular events. And whether that's real or not, there are very, there's very clear guidance and recommendations now that you should not use it in patients who have ischemic heart disease, strokes, uh, et cetera. If you do give them strontium ranulate, you've got to reassess them on a regular basis for the cardiovascular risk. So we're using it in a few patients still, but clearly um, we're using it a lot less than we used to.